Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Moment Live producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Daughters of Abraham, How an Israeli American and Palestinian American are Bridging the Divide Since October 7th. Today's program is part of Moment Amala's collaborative initiative, Beni Adam, Bene Adam, Restoring Humanity, which seeks to bring together our unique, diverse communities to foster a healthy and impactful exchange of dialogue, dispel myths, and build solidarity that transcends beyond borders and religion. I'd like to introduce Daniel Khan, Deputy Director of the Muslim American Leadership Alliance, to say a few words. Dan is a United States Army veteran and Muslim American dedicated to interfaith peace, coexistence, and fighting extremism. Daniel? And thank you, Suzanne. Welcome everybody to this very special webinar. It is an honor to gather with all of you today to explore the themes of peace, understanding, and shared humanity. Principles that are not only central to the remarkable story we'll hear today, but are also deeply needed in our world. Nada, a Palestinian American, Heidi, an Israeli American, together they embark on a transformative journey not just to connect with one another, but to challenge the divisions that often separate us. Whether they are rooted in politics, history, religion, or personal pain, their story reminds us that peace begins not in policy rooms or treaties, but in the courage of individuals who choose to listen, empathize, and humanize with one another. Peace and understanding are not abstract ideas. They are actions, choices, and commitments. At a time where division dominates so much of our global and national discourse, it is essential to ask, what does it mean to truly see one another? How do we foster spaces where dialogue replaces judgment and connection overcomes this conflict? Today's webinar seeks to address these pressing questions. We are truly fortunate to have both Neda and Heidi with us today to share their reflections. Their voices remind us that Recon reconciliation requires empathy, and empathy requires us to embrace the discomfort of confronting our own biases and assumptions. This webinar also builds on the mission of Mala and Moment Magazine to uplift stories that inspire, educate, and challenge us, and remind us about the world we live in. Peace and understanding are not goals for someone else to achieve. There are collective responsibilities that begin with each of us in moments like this one where we pause, reflect, and learn from one another. Let this be more than just a conversation. It is an invitation to be part of a movement that believes in the power of humanity to rise above division and create a better future. Thank you everybody for joining us and Suzanne, back to you. Thank you, Daniel. Following the program, please visit Moment's website at momentmag.com where you can subscribe to the magazine and register for additional upcoming programs. Also be sure to visit Mala's website at malanational.org to learn more about their initiatives. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers and moderators. Netta Hagera is a constitutional attorney, wife and mother. Netta is passionate about using her legal expertise to pr promote human rights and religious liberty. She is also a proud first-generation Palestinian-American. Heidi Bash Harod is a Jewish-American Israeli writer and mother. She serves as the executive director of Women's Voices Now, using film to drive social change that advances girls' and women's rights, and is a daytime Emmy-winning producer. Today's, pr today's moderators include Zainab Khan, founder and chair of MALA, the Muslim-American Leadership Alliance. Zainab has published an oral history review about Mala's Muslim American Journeys program, recording Muslim American oral histories. She was honored with the inaugural UNICEF Next Generation Chicago Humanitarian Award, as well as the 2020 Silver Stevie Award for Female Executive of the Year in the nonprofit sector. Zainab published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on addressing anti-Semitism in the Muslim American community after the heinous terrorist attack in Israel on October 7, 2023. Sarah Brieger is editor of Moment Magazine and director of the Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Sarah has won numerous awards, including first place in Religion Reporting of the Year from the Religion News Association and first place for Best In-Depth News Writing on Religion from the American Academy of Religion. Please welcome Netta Hagera, Heidi Bash Harod, Zainab Khan, and Sarah Brieger. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Suzanne. And thank you, Dan, for helping organize this and also this wonderful partnership. Um, and thank you to Zainab as well for spearheading this uh, wonderful partnership. 
um, you know, the idea of, I think, talking about difference and, you know, cultivating empathy, I think is, you know, an extremely timely topic, maybe the most timely topic um, out there right now. So I'm really excited to get into this conversation. Um, but first, I'm hoping Heidi and Netta, you could tell us a little bit about your own backgrounds. Um, Netta, let's start with you, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, prior to October 7th of 2023, I didn't have much involvement in world affairs or, um, you know, uh, international issues. I was focused on career-wise on our country and the First Amendment and um, defending those liberties. And then um, my personal background is that both of my parents grew up in the West Bank of Palestine. I was born in America. And so Palestine has always been near and dear to my heart, but it never transcended to activism. It was just, you know, I am Palestinian. That's part of my identity. That's part of my culture. And growing up, I had, you know, heard stories from my parents um, about them living under the occupation and uh, their interactions with Jewish soldiers. And it was really in this context of oppression and, you know, checkpoints and taking people's land, you know, all the things. And my parents didn't really have any interactions, at least that they told me that were positive with, you know, Jewish people, Israelis. It was really just a lot of their um, hurt from what they experienced and what they saw growing up in the West Bank. And so um, it wasn't until uh, October 7th that really, I mean, I think for many people, it was in your face and like, you know, you had to think about it, you had to see it, you, um, I had to process a lot. And um, in doing that, really, because there was so much, I would say, emotion, I had to try to figure out where to direct that, you know, it, for the first few weeks, it was just me crying and being angry. And um, so that's when I, you know, just started writing, started talking to people and figuring out how, like, how can I just for myself um, use this energy that I have to do something good to, you know, even if it's just at the very least for my own, you know, for my own well being, and, you know, hopes and dreams, it will help Palestinians, it will help Israelis, just help society, you know, that, that was um, kind of what propelled me into this arena. Heidi? Yes. So um, to answer the question relevant to this conversation, um, I grew up in a in a mixed home. My, my mom's side, they're Catholic Sicilian. On my dad's side, they're Jewish from Europe. And after the Holocaust, they came to the United States. And so I grew up um, in a very proud Jewish home. Israel was always a very major part of my life and understanding. The first time I went was I was 11 years old on a family trip. I went at the age of 15 um, with a youth group trip. And sorry. Uh, and um and so it was always uh, something I was very proud of. And the idea that to be a free people in our own nation was something I held very close and dear to my heart. And then I went to um, UC Berkeley as an undergrad. And that was 19, the fall of 1999, which is also the outbreak of the Second Intifada. And there was a um, growing Students for Justice in Palestine uh, student organization on campus, a chapter on campus, and they came out to protest um, the Intifada and what was happening. And there were signs and there were words like Daria Sin and Intifada and occupation that I, I hadn't, I was not familiar with, right? This is not part of um, uh, normal Hebrew school conversations and lesson plans. And I, I was, I'm a, I've, I've always been a very empathetic person. I've always sought to uh, to resolve conflict, um, whatever, that's just, that's who I am. And so I was utterly shocked that these people who on a regular day were my fellow students suddenly um, were filled with so much fear, rage, and hatred, I would say. That's what, those were the feelings that I had from them. And, um, and I needed to know more. 
And it took a really long time for me to get back to Israel as an adult uh, to understand the conflict for myself, which is what I wanted to do. But in 2007, I went to um, to do an internship at the Palestine Israel Journal, which is based in East Jerusalem. It's a co-published journal, Israelis and Palestinians. It was founded in the early 90s as part of the Oslo process. And uh, I lived in East Jerusalem. I traveled extensively in the West Bank and I started to see Palestine. I, I saw what is Palestine. I met Palestinians. I worked with them. I ate with them. I listened to their stories, to their experiences of occupation, of oppression, of fear. Um, again, things I had never, I just had never heard before. And I started to understand another reality that exists in Israel. And um, and at the same time, as I you know embedded myself in the society, I also saw that Palestinian culture, Palestinian um, Palestinian identity. Th there's there's so many issues even within Palestinian community that I also got to know better. And I decided that in order to do anything substantive and useful in the region, I had to understand what had happened, what happened here. So I um, applied and was accepted into a master's program at Tel Aviv University in Middle Eastern history and very quickly began to learn the very complex history of the region. Um, I also decided I was not going to solve the conflict because that was my intention. And I moved more into women's rights movements of the Middle East, Morocco, Egypt, Iran, the Kurds of Turkey. Um, and then I left. I left the Middle East and came back home and I um, and I got a job with Women's Voices Now and I mainly focused on women's rights uh, all over the world. Um, and then and, and so and so, of course, my Jewish identity has remained very strong. My connection to Israel, my husband, my children, I'm an Israeli. We go back every year. Um, and I, you know, I saw rising tension in the war between Gaza, uh, between Hamas and Israel in 2021. And it concerned me. And then October 7 happened. And all of a sudden it felt like the rug had been pulled out from beneath me because, I mean, war is war and things happen. But for me as a women's rights activist, the the getting news of, of the mass rape that occurred on October 7, um, and then the immediate reaction of the international women's rights community to just have silence and then to deny. And uh, and I it really caused me um, on many levels, deep emotional distress and sort of an under like a you know sudden realization. What have I been doing for the past decade of my life? Like if you know, I thought I was in this with all women. I thought we had certain foundational rules and principles and things that we fight against together. And that wasn't the case. Um, and I, I, you know, if I think back on that time, it's very much like a blur, like it's a very traumatic experience. And then, um, and then through a, another organization that I work with, Empower Women Media, the founder of that said she was starting an Abraham Women's Alliance, bringing Muslim, Jewish, and Christian women together. And uh, and that was the first time in that period that I saw maybe a glimmer of light and and hope for for continuing to do the work that I do in women's rights, but also to um, also stand up for my people, the Jewish people, and for our um, our right to be in our ancestral homeland, which is Israel. And both of your stories are just, they're so powerful. They're so profound. And they're, this is exactly why we need this conversation. So what, what, how did you, how did you two come together? Um, just for, you know, just on a, on a human level as, as women, but then also for this project, what was the backstory with that? Yeah. So as Heidi mentioned, the, um, the organization that gave her that glimmer of hope. Um, one of my friends who I've known for several years, Shireen Tabar, um, who is from Empower Women Media, she put on these Abrahamic panels. And um, as these were once a month calls where we would talk about the Abraham Accords and the importance of them and um, working towards advancing the Abraham Accords. And um, she would have various speakers uh, on a virtual panel. And Heidi and I were um, one of a few other speakers. And I just remember I had not met Heidi and um, didn't know anything about her. But during this call, it was her turn to speak. You know, everyone had gotten their turn to say something. And I believe this was uh, November or December. So shortly after October, um, within those two months. And something that had started to uh, just discourage me was everyone arguing and just stating their point and trying to get you to see their perspective and to hear them 
And in during this uh, panel, Heidi, when it came turn for her to speak, she said she's just taking it all in um, and and she doesn't have anything to say except to thank, you know, she thanked me and some of the other speakers who went before her for sharing and um, just that small, that small thing that she did uh, in the midst of, you know, everyone being so loud and wanting to, sh to explain their perspective was refreshing. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, after that, we connected through Shireen. We both, I believe, independently asked Shireen for each other's information and um, just developed a friendship, a sisterhood of meeting and talking, crying and praying, all the things. <laughs> so it's been really, really sweet. Anything to add, Heidi? Um, no, nothing to, it was uh, a great blessing that I was able to connect with Neda and she was wanting to meet too. It was, I was looking, I was looking for dialogue, listening and for dialogue and for having real conversations about the time that we found ourselves in and are still in right now. Yeah. What were, what were some of the initial conversations like? And then I'm curious, um, what were some of, if you feel comfortable sharing some of the like most difficult conversations, what topics did you guys have that most trouble getting through when you were talking? So what I have found in all of the, all of the work I've done in dialogue, which sounds very clinical. So I seek out to connect with people all the time. And what has been really interesting, especially with the conflict is there's so many assumptions that we make about the other side, about the intentions, and then the fear builds. And then it, it's very clear that we're expecting the worst about and from each other. And so the conversations can't even begin. So what was incredible about Neda and I'm still I'm still incredulous every time she and I have a conversation is her bravery and courage to to hear things that that are not comfortable uh, that might go against what her her life experience. Right. What she's been what she's been given the the oral history of her family, even right? It's that she's willing to sit in that discomfort of. But everything you're saying goes against my lived experience of, of hearing the stories of my parents under occupation and their fear of Israeli soldiers and what Jews mean to us as Palestinians and what your intentions are for our people and our future. So her ability to suspend the judgment and to just really listen with an open heart and an open mind and still stand her ground and her curiosity and questions. And it's just, it's bravery and courage, right? To just ask really hard questions. This has been something that not everyone has that I wish I wish for more people to have. Um, so uncomfortable conversations, you know, so she is going to talk to me about, you know, do I support, you know, how do I feel about Netanyahu and his government? You know, um, what's the difference between the Israeli government and the Israeli people? Um, yeah, what do you think? What do you think about what is occupation? You know, how do you understand that? Um, I remember a really uncomfortable conversation. You know, I felt like at some point, um, this might be like a an empathy to a fault where I sometimes feel uncomfortable even saying, you know, Hamas terrorists, you know, because they're human beings, right? These are someone's son, grandson, nephew. They're not born with hatred in their heart. So, you know, and, and, and I also can understand the viewpoint that these people are standing up for the Palestinian people, even though they're terrorists, right? But so I, I would follow Netta's lead when she would say like, this is a terrorist organization, these are terrorists. And even to like, to understand that in order to do the work that we really have to do, we have to be brave and stand by our our truths. And she stands in her truth and I stand in mine and, and her willingness to be truthful and honest about things that are uncomfortable and difficult about being Palestinian makes me feel safe to be truthful about the things that are uncomfortable to be an Israeli, to be a Jew, and to understand the time that we're in. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. I um, agree wholeheartedly about you and our conversations. And especially in the beginning where um, I was struggling with the um, just the mass casualties, um, to be able to uh, to talk to Heidi about that and to um to ask straight up questions like do you think that the casualties are justified um uh and you know talking about sexual assaults uh, on October 7th 
And it's just really valuable to be able to bring things to her that I know might offend her. Um, but she, she knows that I'm asking genuinely because I actually want to hear the answer and I want to like try to understand because there's a huge portion of the world that agrees with Heidi. And so instead of me villainizing them or mocking, you know, their positions, like actually understand that there there's valid justifications. And um, even if I don't agree with them and I still don't think that the mass casualties are justified ever, um, just as a side note, to be able to hear what she has to say, knowing that she she does value human life, that she loves Palestinians. Um, also, another thing was understanding her perspective of Zionism and instead of thinking, well, you know, all Zionists are, I would cringe even at the word Zionist means you don't, they want to expel Palestinians from the land. And they think that the land is just theirs because God gave it to them. And even if that means having to kill uh, or push out Palestinians, right? That's Zionism and why everyone's opposed to Zionism, all the pro-Palestinians. But to really understand like her actual legitimate religious belief of what Zionism is and that it actually doesn't involve um, harm to Palestinians and it involves, it includes, <laughs> it includes Palestinians living in the land together um, which I know, you know, that's not a, there's so many different definitions of Zionism, but to be able to at least kind of dispel my, you know, my perceptions of what that word means, my assumptions of when everyone says they're Zion, Zionist, what that entails. And so to, to just understand, um, to, it helps me, and particularly as a lawyer where you can't just say the other side has no, no merit and whatever, they're just, you know, full of it. No, like if you, if you're going to be a good lawyer, you understand their best arguments and their best positions and you assume the best. And that is where, that is where you challenge yourself and your position and your client's position. And so Heidi's really been able to, to kind of help me get out of like transcend the us versus them and the emotional, you know, the emotional reasoning. And it's, I feel like it's ingrained like in my DNA and like on a cellular level, like the trauma, the generational, you know, the generational issues. And um, so it does take like some active thinking and talking and processing um, to like to heal that part of me and to heal that even for my children so that I don't pass it on to them, you know, this, the, the vitriol and um, I can, I can, share with them the challenges of Palestinians, of um, what we've been through. And uh, I talked to him, even my seven-year-old daughter about it, but not um, not in a disparaging way of the people of Israel or Jewish people. And so, um, yeah, it's just really been a gift. Um, I was going to kind of goes right into what you both just said. I mean, this, you, you filmed this during a time of like volatility, hostility, and even now, you know, obviously as we're seeing, um, what, what, what's happened is like, and, and this is what I think is so important in the film is that you both kind of had to share the struggle of justifying your existence of having your histories erased or, you know, minimized or um, completely construed because of, you know, you have to choose this side or that side. And, and that's really, that's, that was a profound message. So can you, you know, talk us through that in regards to that human emotion of just justifying your existence, your history, you know, not at what you said, intergenerational trauma and Heidi, you being, you know, a survivor of, uh, of Holocaust, uh, you know, you being a, a a descendant of Holocaust as a survivor, like how how did this impact your identity? Um, so so just taking it back a step. So so as Ned and I were having these conversations, we both agreed that perhaps what we were talking about in our growing relationship um, could stand to benefit others, and we had to think about how could we share out into the world. Um, 
kind of the miraculous thing that we were doing in the most difficult time in our lifetimes. So we, um, we assigned each other that we would write, we would write sort of an essay together. And one night it was in December, it was rainy here. And I of course was waiting to like the last second or the self-imposed deadline we put upon ourselves to start writing. And I turned on my computer and my little desk lamp and I saw that she was on the Google doc. And so I read what Netta was writing and my, what I wrote was basically a resp it was more of like a response to what she had written. And that this was our Daughters of Abraham essay. And then we tried to figure out how can we, um, yeah, how, who would take this on, right? Who would get this out in the world? So it was a little challenging to find a, a, a outlets to publish. Uh, we were able to get the essay published, Daughters of Abraham, on the Fair Observer um, and Times of Israel. And in the process, I had asked Shireen Taber of Empower Women Media, you know, do you have any other outlets that you think would be interested in this. And then she had a read and she said, really, this should be made into a short film. And although I've been working in a film organization for the past 12 years, I am not a filmmaker. And that was, a, I kind of laughed, ha ha ha, like make a film, really, how? And then um, Shireen just sort of laid out how that could easily happen. And one of her colleagues created a, um, a script from our essay. And then, um, and then there I have a, a young woman who works with me at Women's Voices Now. And she's a filmmaker and she was our director. And one day we shot this whole film in Orange County in March and spent a week editing. And then it was out in the world. Um, and I think the entire process of how, how it changed my my identity. So after October 7, I was and, every, and, and the response to October 7, I saw myself for the first time, you know, I am I'm one of those like, it's a small world after all. I believe that the barriers between, you know, coming from a multi-faith family, when I was in the sixth grade, my best friends were a Hindu from India, a Coptic Egyptian, a uh, Persian Muslim, a Taiwanese Buddhist, um, an African-American Christian, myself. I mean, I, I grew up like, really, we can all get along. There is no question about that. So I have always pushed and known, believed and known from my own lived experience that we all can get along despite our differences because we are part of a shared humanity. And, but after October 7, I was like, no, like it's done. Like there is no, like I need to hunker down. I need to stand up for the Jewish people. That is the first and foremost identity that I need to go out into the world with. There's, there's no apology. This is not the time to falter, to, you know, ignore things that I would uh, brush under the rug before. So I just felt like, that's it. Like I'm going into like island mode. And then the process of meeting Netta, writing the essay and creating the film, it has, you know, I, my heart has to continually be opened and opened and opened because there's so much hatred out there, or there's so much hatred that I choose to consume through social media or watching the news. So um, very rapidly, I wanted to close off from the world and just be within my Jewish community. And then the experience of really you know, connecting with Netta on a very serious, deep level in these very difficult times. Um, I'm a little tentative still, you know, like I think my circle is small and still very protective and protected, but um, I still would like to think that I'm working toward that dream of we really can all be on this earth together and, and live in harmony um, with bumps along the road, of course. So yeah, that's how this process has, you know, helped to heal my identity, I guess. Yeah, after October 7. Yeah, and I, uh, part of the healing for me is, you know, I, as I don't want to admit it, it really was um, the hatred and anger that I felt. Um, and, you know, there's one thing to to be sad and and have pain for what's happening to your to you, your people the palestinians are my people so it's not that that that's bad or or anything but the way that that naturally came out of me particularly um immediately after october 7th when i knew and i kind of just braced myself for the bombardment on gaza um It was, I was angry like, and just wishing death upon those who are doing that to my people, um, you know, an eye for an eye. And at one point, like the worst, <laughs> hate to confess it, but to be like transparent, I had a moment of thinking, Iran, where are you? Why are you not protecting Palestinians? Like what, do something. 
someone do something to Israel. Um, and again, while that's not, I don't blame myself for that, or, you know, that's part of like human emotion, but at the same time, like there's some, there's, that's like, I, there's clearly something wrong, you know, there's clearly something wrong when I just want other people to be, to, to die because my people are being killed. That is not, that's not what I want to teach my children. That's not even what I want to like be feeling when I lay in bed at night. And so um, a big part of healing was like that, that hatred and that anger um, where, where I can be at a place to um, express my opinion about the terrible things that the Israeli government are doing and their lack, um, their lack of value of Palestinian lives. And, you know, without passing by a synagogue and just feeling gross. Um, and I really, again, hate to admit that, but to like, for part of that for me was getting like dealing with those feelings and processing them and facing them head on and like going to two weeks after October 7th, going to a, a memorial at a synagogue and sitting there with them as they're praying for IDF and these soldiers, knowing that my people are getting bombs dropped on them, <laughs> women, children. <laughs> um, but to, to, to do that, to sit there, you know, even with tears, silent tears streaming down my face, but to like, just be with them, right? Um, it was healing. And it's we don't heal and grow, you know, where we sit in the comfort of our own homes and our own echo chambers. We grow when we put ourselves in challenging positions, when we face, like when we do some introspection about what you're feeling and why you're feeling that. And so um, going back to like with Heidi being able to express like honestly express things like I just did um, is, is just freeing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so, I mean, it's so rare and unique to, I think, you know, hear, hear that perspective because, you know, so many people I interact with now, everything is so defensive. And if you say anything um, like express pain or, for the other side, you know, you get this kind of feeling that it's, you know, suffering is a zero sum game in a way. And, you know, giving some sort of hand out to someone else is somehow taking away from your, your side, which actually I hate the word side in this situation. Um, have you found, how have like friends and family reacted to what um, you guys have been doing? Um, I know in, in my circles, you know, often people say like, we don't really have the bandwidth to deal with thinking about other people right now. Um, you know, that's for, you know, that's for the future. That's for another time when things are calmer. I'm curious if that's, if that's been your experience as well. I'll go first. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I've had a mixed experience. I think, you know, the people who are closest to me know that this is who I am. This, I will always be doing this kind of work. So I, I don't think it came as a surprise that I would, find Netta and that we would have this conversation and the work that we're doing together. Um, uh, when we, the first cut of the film, um, I was happy with it, but I had my husband watch it, who is a former IDF captain and an Israeli born and raised and two of my friends who are Jewish, one who's also Israeli and Jewish. And um, that was really important to have them to get their feedback and to see how they responded. Um, they, you know, so I'm answering the question by way of it's, it's been a little bit of everything people who understand, like they, they know what my, where my heart is and how strong I stand up and show up for the Jewish people and for Israelis as well. So they know that something I would say, I want to put this out in the world is not to diminish or to detract or to undermine the Jewish people and our, and our, and our right to be in Israel. So, you know, I think like those trusted relationships allowed for people in my circle to feel like they could take that in. Um, and so I've gotten good feedback of folks who have watched the film. Um, we haven't yet shown it at my synagogue and that's more of the, like, it's not time yet. Um, and whether or not I agree or disagree is not important when it's time. I, I look forward to bringing it to my, you know, home community. Um, so I would say I've gotten largely positive 
positive feedback, uh, especially I think it's been really positive for folks who are not in not in this conflict directly, right? So neither Palestinian nor Israeli or Jewish or Muslim who just want the world to calm down already, right? Like I think that our story gives that hope and and you see it, right? So you have hope because you actually see it in action. Um, so I, I've had a largely positive reception of this work that I'm doing with Netta, which I'm I'm grateful for. And even if I didn't, by the way, I would continue to do it. You know, it, it's not like, I know it's the right thing to do. So it'll continue no matter what for me. Yeah, uh, I agree. There's been mixed reaction, um, which has been, it's been kind of fascinating um, to see. Uh, so immediately um, I had gotten a text from one of my friends after, I think it was October 8th or October 9th. And it was, the text was free, free Palestine. And I, I said, I expressed, yes, but also, you know, innocent Israelis were killed and um, that I was feeling sympathy for them. And then the, the text back was, um, you're a self-hating Palestinian. Um, so that was like, just dysregulating to, to see that. Um, and I've been unfriended for when I do you know, I don't post a lot on social media, but some of the things that I posted uh, from actually from both sides, which which tells me that I'm doing something right. You know, I have friends who are very pro-Israel and, you know, they don't think I am pro-Israel enough. My husband's more on the pro-Israel side and also was like, you know, pushing me to grow and to consider and loves when I, you know, share with him that I'm doing this. Like, he's just like, hey, that's going to be so great for you um we're going to Israel and all the things he just wants me to to go and do it and part of that too he's you know met my parents and has heard them one of my first my mom um she passed away god rest her soul but one of her first conversations with my husband was sit down let me tell you like all of the terrible things that the Jews do have done to to my people and you know, my mom is an uneducated, she, you know, didn't graduate like elementary school and just very quite emotional about it, near and dear to her heart, also holds on to all of that trauma and lived through that, uh, lived through the occupation and just, yeah, so so she, she sat with him and just was telling him all the things and there is no, in her limited vocabulary, especially English, not, you know, not speaking English well, it was the Jew, like when she would talk about what was happening, the Jews did this, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And so, um, yeah, all that to say is it's been, I've been getting, I've been getting it from both sides and definitely have uh, whittled down my friends a little bit. Um, it's not a terrible thing. <laughs> so yeah, and I get like, like Heidi said, I've, I'm kind of used to going against the grain of, um, you know, what my family thinks and believes. Um, five of my sisters had arranged marriages. I picked my own husband. It was, it was like small, not small as that is, but it's like a basic thing that normal people do. It was, it, it was revolutionary. <laughs> and so um, I really don't, it doesn't bother me necessarily when um, people disagree with my, what I'm, what I'm doing. And you know, the reason even that like the motivating factor again, besides like myself and healing my own heart and um, is that maybe someone will follow, you know, maybe in the future, whether, where they are in a better place, where it's less emotional, you know, maybe they will consider like, let's, I, sh I should go to coffee with a Jewish person just, just because, you know, and I should just listen. Um, or vice versa, you know, some of my pro-Israel people like, hey, maybe I should consider, you know, what Palestinians are suffering, um, what they're going through in some of their, some of their issues that, that they can point to that are unjust, that are, um, that, that they believe are violating the human rights of Palestinians. Like, let's, let's consider that instead of just saying we 100% have to justify every action of the Israeli government. We fully stand beside Israel. Actually, can we like take a moment and um, 
and think about Palestinian lives if we do value value human lives and human suffering and victims. So um, yeah, that's that's my um, brain, my uh, word dump about it. <laughs> <laughs> It was a very eloquent word dump, if I may say. <laughs> did, did a very eloquent job of this, but you know the the disappointment that um, the community kind of puts on you for showing empathy, you know, or for showing extending an olive branch to the other side, or trying to be you know, middle grounded and, and, and like you, you mentioned, like listening and learning from a different perspective, like what was your reaction to that? Like your community's response and Heidi, I'm curious also, you know, to hear from you, like as you how do you react to like your community's disapproval? You want to go ahead, Nida? Yeah. So you were cutting out a little bit, but um, it, I think the question was like, how how did it make us feel, or how did we react to the disapproval and the backlash? Um, so at first, it it was just shocking um it was shocking like immediately because i'm also i'm uh politically conservative and republican and so i have that community and then immediately theirs were like changing their profile pictures to like i stand with israel and the israeli flag and and then also immediately on the palestinian side again viva viva palestina and like waving the flag and it was like I really thought it was like a football game, you know, where you just see two people rooting for their side. And it was, and I was able to see both extremes because I am so deeply entrenched in the conservative Republican communities. And I am Palestinian and I have seven sisters and 29, I think, nephews and nieces who are on these college campuses and who do feel passionately about Palestine and so that it was just like where is where can can i find something that like acknowledges the suffering of both people and uh, also doesn't look at it from one side or another um because you know to me it's like the liberation of palestine is is cannot be disconnected from the liberation of Israel. And even though Israel is a prosperous, rich, you know, country, a powerful country, they deserve to not have to worry about missiles being fired upon them, about not having these like alarms where they have to go to shelters. Like Israelis also deserve to not fear for their lives, right? And um, I don't want to argue about how much more Palestinians are are being hurt or how, you know, the, the quantity of Palestinians killed. And I just like... I just want people to acknowledge that the safety and security and um, value of Israelis and Palestinians are mutually exclusive. Like we both want this. It's in the, our best interest, even if our politicians um, are profiting off war or want the power, like let's let's transcend that. And let's understand that um, for the benefit of both Israelis and Palestinians, we need to be different. We need to do something different and not do the, the both sides thing. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll answer it in response, like to uh, mirror what Netta was saying. So I am in more the Democrat progressive spheres and spaces. And so I would say, so including my, the Jewish community that I am a part of, I would, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a few Jewish communities here in Southern California. So one is definitely more like, you know, it's Orthodox so by default, like more conservative and probably more on the right. And my home synagogue where I grew up is definitely more on the left and progressive. Um, but, uh, you know, above all else, my experience as a, as a Jewish person in, is in America is that, you know, Jews, 
at least the people that I'm with, it is not a an either or future, right? It is an understanding of a conflict between two peoples. And yes, we have a right to our land, but it does not mean that Palestinians cannot be there or that they do not also deter, um, deserve and have to fight for self-determination and human dignity. So I've never been in an extreme environment. Um, I think what was really hurtful and upsetting was when I, and this is in the world of in, of social media and, and, you know, emails and things where in my women's rights work, I do work with a lot of very progressive left organizations, or I did, and just seeing individual leaders within those communities posting things like, oh, there was a Zionist in my classroom today. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Like, that sounds like someone with a, a virus or like a KKK member. And I'm like, how, how did we, how did we get here? Like, what are we? So it was really eye opening, And, and, and instead of having confrontations, my, my response was, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to use my social media platform, even though it's myself is private because I don't need to be a public person, but you know, just showing different news articles or different, even just the experiences of, of Israelis, that missiles continue to fall, that people are committing suicide, even though they uh, survived the Nova massacre, you know, just like just sort of humanizing because there's definitely, we know this, this is not our conversation, but there's a clear algorithmic division on what you see based on what you, you, t you know, trend toward. So how can I just show up in my full self um, and my balanced self showing different sides of this conflict and in, in, in a variety of opinions and viewpoints and experiences to, to maintain the middle? Um, and and just to insist that that's who I am, I'm not going to be pulled in either direction. And I do find, especially in times of crisis, people need steady, sturdy leadership, right? So if we can if we can hold steady and and stay in our middle ground, like people need to know that that's possible, or else they are just pulled and tugged into their extreme sides. So even though, so there's some people that I don't have conversations with anymore. You know, that I'm not working with them. Um, it's not my, I, I don't see my job as like convincing them, but if I can walk my talk, then that's the best way I can know. And that, that maybe when they're like Netta said, less emotional in a, in a better place, when things, the day to day, like warfare has died down and we see that, you know, we do move through this. We're just in a period of time, then maybe they'll be willing to think about things I posted or things I've said or conversations like this and, and, and reconsider, you know, and I, I, I love, you know, there's been times when I have had conversations with people that have made me so upset and angry and I want to shut down. And I just think of Netta and her willingness to stay in the difficult place and to not choose hate. And that's really helped me to not, um, to not fall for the trap, which does happen once in a while. So I just, I even, um, I just returned from a inter a multi-faith forum in Dubai and I had some difficult conversations with women from Syria and Lebanon and, um, it, you know, to be told who I am and told what I think and, and just told, you know, repeated conspiracy theories and things like this. And just, you know, it's not my job to, um, to change those people. And I have Netta, so um, I could calm down and just remember that it's possible when people are willing to be in a space of not wanting to feel hate in their heart, then they can listen to things that expand, expand their capacity for information and, and empathy. Has, has anything changed either in, in your guys thinking since, um, you know, you published your essay, you created your film, um, you know, it's now November 19th, you know, 2024. Um, would you have written anything or done anything differently um, now that, you know, so much time has passed? Um, I don't think so. I know, you know, even some of the things that I said today, like uh, I sometimes I think if I were to run for political office and someone pulls out these little clips of me saying, you know, <laughs> my hatred towards Israel or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't, I think I like the process of learning and growing. So I don't necessarily think I would change anything. Um, and yeah, I did, I did learn to see the other perspective and to be able to argue the other, like I can argue, uh, not as well as Heidi, obviously, but I can take the pro Israel position and articulately, intelligently, genuinely argue why they do some of the things that they do and why they believe some of the things that they believe. Um, uh, so, you know, now, again, naturally, I, I, I'm Palestinian through and through, I'm a proud Palestinian and I love Palestine. I love the Palestinian people. And, 
you know, I'll fight for them till my death. Um, but to me, the, the fight is not towards people. It is towards the cause and, and hopefully toward a solution. Um, yeah, it's helped me to have more balance, um, more balance of like what na naturally my feelings and my thoughts and even just like the time that I spend, um, you know, it used to be like the zero sum game. Well, if I'm going to cry over someone, I'm going to like show me the Palestinian news. Um, I don't actually have time to look into the suffering of Israelis. Like there's way too much. Um, so it did, it helped me to be able to know that holding space for Israelis and understanding them does not in any way undercut my pro-Palestinian position and my passion and my loyalty to Palestinians that to me, in fact, it advances that. Um, my conversations with Heidi, I get to speak to um, an Israeli and, and tell her about Palestine and be um, an example to her of Palestine. So when she thinks of a Palestinian, like she was saying, she remembers Netta, right? And she, she wants to help Palestinians and she cares about them. Um, she doesn't think of them as like someone who are, who's trying to to take her identity and who thinks Zionism or a Zionist is a derogatory word. Um, and so it's helped me to just embrace embrace Israelis in um, knowing that that doesn't conflict and it enhances my pro-Palestinian position. So for me to, to, the way I want to answer that question, the word responsibility came to mind that this whole, this process, I have a responsibility to my community. Um, like Neta was saying, just because I have compassion, empathy, and can see things from the other side does not detract from my loyalty, my Zionism, my Judaism, my, you know, multi, my complex identity as an American, Israeli, as a Jew. And if I can be an example to my community members, especially the younger ones, especially the teenagers who are very confused and scared and intimidated. And I, the, the last thing that I would want to see is that, you know, young Jewish people move away from their their, Jew, their their holistic Jewish identity, that we're not just a religion, we're a culture, we're a people, we are, you know, we have a history, we have a shared language, we have a connection to a certain place. I don't want them to let go of that because they think that means it's the right side of the his of history. Or if they let go of that, then something will be fixed in the land because that's not true. Like we have to, we have to come forward together in our in our complete um, beauty and flaw, right? So how how do I influence, especially the younger generation that I have influence over? young Jewish people that I interact with to be proud of who they are and to know that even if there are ugly parts of history or there's complex parts of history, I don't, they should not be asked to choose between maintaining that to be accepted in society or not. So how can the example that Netta and I set help to empower them to know that that's the right way forward and not giving up and turning against their own people, that that's not the answer to the future together? Yeah, I want to also add that something um, that that I've learned through our conversations is, you know, I can I can focus on the issues within the Israeli government and Israeli culture, Jewish, you know, right wing culture, um, but that's actually like not in my control, um, and also. Palestinians need leadership. If we're going to have peace talks, who's going to do that? It's not going to be Hamas. It's just not. Um, and that's not who I want leading Palestinians. I don't even think Palestinians, dare I say, want Hamas to lead them. They can't speak up against Hamas because they'll get beheaded. Um, but it, uh, our conversations help me to see that we are in desperate need of leadership within uh, Palestine. Uh, leadership that that uh, wants peace, leadership that acknowledges the state of Israel, not just acknowledges, but um, sees the value and the humanity. Um, and so, and also the issues within Palestinian society. Again, uh, five of my sisters had arranged marriages. One of them was 14. They took, my parents took her to Palestine. She didn't want to get married. 
uh, she told that to the sheikh and that he did it anyway. So, and she married a man 10 years older than her that she never met, came back to the States. I don't want to, I don't want that. You know, if I'm going to fight for Palestine and defend it, uh, I want something different. I don't want that to continue happening in this day and age. It absolutely should not happen. And so um, I acknowledge that, you know, if Israel just, you know, packed up all their, their weapons and their soldiers tomorrow and said, okay, let's work this out. Uh, I don't know that that, that there would be any way to work through that. I think we have to, it's essential that Palestinians themselves get behind a leadership that Palestinians within Palestine step up as leaders for their people. Um, otherwise, there is no getting out of this. It's going to be the minute that that IDF withdraws, Hamas is going to want to now also get retribution, eye for an eye, anger, you know, those, those boys that watch their families get killed. Um, they're not just going to, if they don't have a leader showing them peace and prosperity and, and helping them to see that, oh, they're just going to want to go get revenge and avenge the deaths of their innocent family members, the civilians. And so again, it's just, it's helped me to see that I can be a victim and I can say that Israel is, you know, it's all Israel. <laughs> but at what point do we take accountability um, while, again, while also holding Israel accountable for the things that they've done, they continue to do that are wrong and that the, the innocent lives that have arguably, <laughs> I'm going to say arguably to be diplomatic, arguably did not have to die. It was because of some power hungry, you know, leader in Israel who, who decided that. And if he, you know, Israelis within Heidi's also helped me understand that a lot of Israel's and she's, she said, correct me if I'm wrong, Heidi, that a majority of Israelis in Israel are rising up and they don't like what Netanyahu is doing. They don't like um, the continuation of, of ag aggression and war and they want change. Um, and they acknowledge that, please Heidi, correct, I wanna hear from you when you're done, but acknowledge that Netanyahu is just a power hungry warmonger who wants to stay in power. Yeah, I don't know. So I think a majority of Israelis, they're trying to survive day to day, right? Husbands, sons are at war and they don't know that they're coming home and there's 101 hostages still that haven't returned. But there's definitely a, a I, I don't know if it's a majority because they have to go to elections, right? So to speak a majority, but there is a very strong sentiment in Israel that Netanyahu's ongoing it seems he puts himself before the state. I would say that's what I'm comfortable in saying, that his intentions are not necessarily clear. And he also is carrying forward intentions of his of the government that keeps him in power. So it's not someone who is of public service. And at the same time, it's an incredibly frightening, unknown time. And on, on some level, you just have to you have to follow orders, right? And again, not right or wrong, but it's a time of war, time of great fear, time of great certainty, whether it's from Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or from Iran directly. I mean, there's just no, there's no break right now. But I would, no question that on October 6th, hundreds of thousands of Israelis would gather every week to protest what Netanyahu was trying to do. And so, no, there is not, um, there is great dissatisfaction with his performance. And yes, people, no one wants this killing to be happening that's for sure no one wants this met because it just keep, there's no end right like like you were saying like children who see their families killed in cold blood from a bombardment or whatever the situation is it is not going to leave them with a warm and fuzzy feeling about the person who just did that to them so there needs to be something different that comes out of this I think I think we have time. Well, we're out of time, but we can take do like maybe, you know, one or two questions. Um, a, a few people um, kind of asked, you know, is there work being done? Um, is there is there work similar to this being done in other places? And then, you know, someone else asked, is there a way to scale this work up so more people can be involved? Mm. 
I think this work is being done in other places. It's very small, an organization that, again, it's, yeah, I would say it's very small. There's um, a few like Sharaka NGO is a Middle East based organization that's bringing um, Jews and, and Muslims or Jews and Arabs or different people to different countries to build bridges. Um, I think, so, So Neda and I, we're going to have a screening of Daughters of Abraham at Occidental College in Los Angeles on Friday night. And I think that to me, and I believe she agrees with me, these conversations need to go viral, right? Like that, that, that film, that five minute film needs to be everywhere because it shows a different perspective. And our, our young people, our students, they're the ones with the most energy, right? Like theoretically, they've got the most oomph in their, in their daily lives to go make change and to have better conversations about things. So my hope is that, um, that our film would get out there more, that those who are with us today or who have access to college students would share with them our film and ask them if this is something that matters to them, that they would propose this to a student group or to whomever is in charge of such programming on campus. Because honestly, no, it's I don't think it's happening enough. I see little things here and there, and um, and that's part of the problem. There is no civil discourse on this, and the adults in the room are not largely setting a better example at all. Yeah, I agree. There's some organizations, even within um, Israel and Palestine, Women of the Sun, um, and they work together. And there, there have I've been hearing and seeing more lately. Um, but yes, uh, I so Heidi and I, I, I wasn't seeing any of that uh, coming together at all. And so that's kind of what propelled me to be willing to make the film and um, was because there's a lack of it. And I hope that we can, that we can see, we will see more of it. No, and I think this kind of, you know, wraps up the, the webinar so beautifully, you know, this kind of work, I know at least from, from Mala's perspective and from Moment Magazine, it was so important for us to have this partnership um, B'nai Adam, you know, which is shared humanity after October 7th, especially when it comes to Muslim Jewish American relations. And so, you know, this is a second program that we've done, um, you know, very successfully, and we look forward to sharing more, um, not just with, you know, Moments community, but with Mala's community and new people that are joining in and sharing and like listening in and seeing that these kinds of conversations and programs do happen. Um, and, you know, we will be sharing the link to this webinar with everybody that's registered with Moments um, news list, with Mala's news list. We'll be sharing it on our social media, on Mala. And, you know, I just, I keep encouraging people, at least from our community, from the Muslim American community is like, watch this, make this viral, have these conversations in your mosques, have these conversations in your community centers at the dinner table, because this is what actually makes change. It fosters change, not just here at home, but what we teach our children, how we behave is what how we talk, right? And so this is why this is, to me, this is optimism and hope. So thank you, um, you know, Heidi and Nada, both for for your wisdom, for your honesty, for your vulnerability, and for for sharing your you know your heart and soul. Um, it's not easy, and I commend you both for doing that. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. So glad to be here with you all today. Um, and, and just to echo Zainab, thank you guys for such a you know open and vulnerable conversation where. You know, it didn't feel like we were trying to score points. We were just kind of talking to, to one another. Um, and I really appreciated that. Um, and so, yeah, thanks to everyone. Um, and please, you know, check in on our website, Moments website for our latest programs and our latest, pro our new programs with Mala coming up soon. Thank you.